Good morning everybody and welcome to the second day of our summer school, the next summer school, this time virtually. Um, the title of our summer school is And Yet It Moves. Um, we, need, we need new education for new normality. My name is Lana Jurko, I will be your moderator for today. Uh, and before I introduce uh, my guest, I will just give you a little bit of logistics and also how the day will look. Uh, the slide will come up on your screen, uh, but what is important for now is that I ask you kindly uh, to leave your mics uh, off uh, so that we don't have background noise. It will be better for your experience and ours. Um, and also, if you want to comment or you would like to uh, ask a question, you can take the floor after we have the first session uh, by uh, putting a comment in the chat. Both the a question or uh, if you would like to, to, to speak. Um, the other thing I want to tell you also about the, the day, how it looks, we start today with a very short introduction of today and a little bit of reflection on yesterday. Um, and then we have um, uh, our guest, uh, our first guest, Ejat Emil Kuran, who will uh, be speaking and then there will be a question and answer session. This first session will last until about 12 o'clock. At that time, we will have a short break, a 15 minutes break. And then after uh, the break, we start with uh, another input from Nikolina Rajkovic from Institute for Political Ecology. And she will be talking about uh, democratization of public services. Um, we sh and then after that, we'll also have a question and answer session. We hope to finish 12.30, 12.45 at the latest. So thank you for joining us. Um, yesterday we kicked off uh, with uh, two very inspiring uh, lectures on uh, degrowth, degrowth philosophy, uh, presentations by Mladen Domazet uh, from Institute of Political Ecology here in Zagreb and a colleague of his, or former colleague of his, uh, Oksana Lopatny, who used to be a junior research fellow at the same uh, institution. The follow-up discussion uh, and um, questions and comments we had really questioned uh, what is the relevance of degrowth in a society, in current societies that we live, uh, concerning the nation states that we are living in, the diversity of uh, cultural diversity and all other diversities that we have, and of course the society which is based uh, on profit, profit orientation. Mm. And of course the unavailable question whenever we talk about degrowth, does that mean no development? Um, all hard questions without easy answers, uh, but I would like to quote here Mladen who said that degrowth is not the horizon. The horizon is social justice and ecological stability. Um, and degrowth is this path, hopefully the path uh, to this good world, let's call it. Um, this path can also be negotiated, so it's not a straight line. Uh, we're not sure how to get that, but as long as we have an idea what is on the horizon, in a way, it seemed that um, this connects really well to today's discussion mm -hmm. on democracy. Because I strongly believe that democracy used to be our horizon. <laughs> and we strongly believe that democracy is the path to social justice, ecological stability, and again, a good life. Unfortunately, it seems that it might have not been. Um, yeah. it, but the problem is that it was. It wasn't because it seems that it brought more inequality, ecological crisis, economic crisis, and all other crises that we can um, imagine, actually. The pandemic did not help, neither the degrowth, although it seems at first glance that this will be a good because we stopped flying, we stopped using all this CO2 and so on, but it brought um, to the forefront all the weaknesses of our societies, and I think also the weakness of democracy. So today I'm very happy that we have a pleasure that uh, our guest is uh, Ece Temel Kuran, a political journalist and a novelist, um, and very happily she lives down in Zagreb, so we were able to host her here in our office. And I will now pass the word for her to her. Um, I'm very excited to, oh, to listen you. to you, and also, of course, to later discuss some comments from our audience. Thank you, Lana. Um, it is a little bit weird to do this online. Everybody is seeing us, but then we don't uh, see you. So 
it feels a little bit paranoid for me. Um, but then, yes, it does connect. And I am very curious about this idea of the growth, one of the biggest topics of our time. Uh, and who, uh, whom, to whomever you ask, uh, you would you know, hear the same words. Extraordinary times, something is coming, the old is dying, but the new is not born, a hello to Gramsci, and so on. Uh, but then not all of us are able to put a name on it. What's happening and what's going to happen, how this, all the new progressive politics that we are witnessing at this point, all the protests, all the uprisings, how would they evolve to a new politics? That's one of my main questions nowadays. Um, and, you know, the title of uh, this sort of presentation uh, was uh, from ban uh, evil of banality to uh, joy of dignity. And I think it really, you know, this is why I chose the title, because this is, I think, I want to believe uh, that this is how it will evolve today's politics to the horizon. For me, the horizon is joy of dignity. And I do want to believe that we are finally entering the age of dignity. Uh, I chose the word dignity because it cuts through all, um, you know, it has the potential to cut through the class differences, uh, gender differences, ethnicities, race, and several other differences among us. Um, and all these differences, we assume that they were, you know, part of our diversity and so on. But they also made the political movements, of progressive political movements of our world, a little bit too messy and too, uh, you know, amorphous. So at this point, I think we need to come together, we need to bring our demands together to form a new world. Um, we are going through a very interesting time, times in terms of the zeitgeist. Uh, by the beginning of 20th century, uh, the sense of time was completely different than it is today. Yeah. We have now the sense of urgency because we know that we don't have too much time to think because the time of earth is coming to an end unless we do something uh, to reverse this current of uh, you know apocalypse so to speak um, but before getting there maybe we should a little bit talk about this banality of evil and evil of banality uh, what I consider uh, you know the when I look at uh, our times, I see that we need to ch reverse the term, Hannah Arendt's famous term of banality of evil. Yes, there was banality of evil in Hannah Arendt's times in 20th century, but as we, you know, began 21st century, I think the term sort of reversed. Um, now, people do not need to be ordered to kick a Syrian child on Hungarian border or they do not need to be forced to develop apathy towards others, or they do not need to, to, to joke about the pain of other people. Um, and it was the understanding of Hannah Arendt that you know, banality, evil, evil, banality of evil comes through this authority. It was forced upon people from top of the politics, whereas uh, in our times, in times of evil of banality, it is as if this uh, banality, accumulated banality, made a qualitative um, leap towards becoming an entity itself. Now the uh, evil comes, the demand of evil comes from grassroots and it rises uh, towards the upper echelons of politics. That's why today we have uh, leaders like Trump, Boris Johnson, Orban and several other, several other right-wing populist, uh, neo-fascist leaders uh, in the cradle of democracy in Europe. Um, but then the new politics, the new progressive movements, and I see them as a long walk, a long march that started uh, in 1990s with Seattle, uh, has been going on since then and it is evolving in front of our eyes. These new progressive movements are trying to find a, a shape uh, for themselves. They're trying to find a shelter for themselves. But our representative democracies 
are organically a mismatch with these um, new uh, political movements. So whenever these new political movements, like in the United States or more uh, visibly in Spain, when they want to uh, integrate themselves to representative democracies, uh, somehow they fail to carry all their colors and energy mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, traditional institutions. And also these traditional institutions of representative democracy cannot contain the infiniteness uh, of these moments. So it's as if we in every country there is the same conversation. Why don't they all come together? Why don't why doesn't you know Tahir create a new model? Why doesn't Gezi or you know uh, Spanish movement create a new movement, new democracy? Because you know these two Lego pieces that look like really a good match uh, somehow don't do not click to each other, uh, whichever you push them together. It is because these movements are actually questioning the idea of representative democracy and they are trying to find a way uh, to create a um, more direct democracy. They're making several attempts to create this, to realize uh, this feminist ideal of collective leadership. And probably we are going to see this new model invented in our lifetimes, hopefully. But then, um, unfortunately, uh, the urgency of the problems, not only political problems such as rising fascism, but also the climate change uh, and the surrounding problems, the urgency of them um, requires these political movements to incorporate themselves to our representative democracies. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm writing a book uh, and there's a chapter dedicated to this. How can this happen? How can we reimagine participation? How can we reinvent participation? Uh, that uh, a, a, a sort of a participation model that can go beyond uh, the current uh, form of representative democracy. Uh, and while I was thinking and reading about this, um, I, I saw this funny thing. Uh, there is a, you know, during the European Union elections in 2019, uh, I saw a post uh, from an Instagram user who was actually hired by a social media uh, company uh, to organize people, to rally people, young people, to vote for European Union, to vote in European Union elections. And her post was her beautiful round butt. Uh, in sports outwear, uh, outfit and underneath uh, there was the campaign if you give a shit that was the hashtag of the campaign if you give a shit give a vote and then I thought how desperate can an institution be as European Union uh, to make to try to make itself look sexy uh, through such means uh, and then you know and then I thought this is the symbolic picture of representative democracy today. It is not sexy anymore, it doesn't create any um, excitement in people and the new uh, generation, the you know highly politicized new generation, do not even consider to utilize their energy uh, in these you know political institutions. They're not really interested um, so that's why these so, you know desperate social media campaigns are underway. But then I saw another footage on TV one day and that made me think. In 2016 uh, on uh, Bay, that's a vacation destination on the Aegean coast in Turkey, um, the mayor bought a um, junk uh, airplane and then he put it under the water. And then the thing is, uh, by time the sea will envelope it, the sea life will embrace it and this wreck will, the plane wreck, will become a reef. So the wreck divers can go and take a you know swim in this old airplane and by the time it seems all these wrecks become, uh, become reefs and you cannot see the plane anymore or you cannot see the junk anymore. So I thought maybe the new political movements are like, uh, should be like the sea life. They should cover 
occupy and mm -hmm. embrace and transform the wreck of the institutions to make them, to turn them uh, to something completely different until uh, the uh, last traces of those institutions are lost. Mm -hmm. So I think we might have to uh, reconsider or reimagine participation in term, not in terms of voting anymore, mm -hmm. but in terms of occupying the political spaces. And uh, I know that there is a reluctance among, new gener among the new generation and among the progressive politics of today to take over the power because these pol new political movements um, do not understand participation as giving the vote. They understand participation as embracing all, leaving nobody behind and out. Uh, during the Occupy moments, during the you know protests such as Tahrir Gezi or several others, we've seen that they are uh, they are embracing all irreg irregularities and they don't want to be reduced to something than they already are. Uh, so that is why I think the participation will be reimagined by this new generation in a different way. And where does joy of dignity? comes to this picture. Uh, we imagine dignity, the word dignity, uh, with pictures like you know, clenched teeth, tight fists, shouting, anger, fury, and you know, uh, fury, pain, and so on. But in these new moments, transform the idea of that word, and as soon as they went onto the streets, even though there was immense oppression and suppression uh, upon them, they showed that asking for your dignity, demanding your dignity, and actually seizing your dignity by physically being there, uh, you become a joyful person. And I think in today's world, what is missing is that joy of being full, uh, uh, fully human. So they showed us by physically performing that once you ask for your dignity, you have the joy of life. And that is the ultimate joy of life. It's not like, you know, your Instagramish joy, uh, artificial fake thing. So, um, and I think this changed the zeitgeist uh, and also it changed our understanding of politics and so on. So this joy, this is my prediction and hopefully it will come true. This joy, I guess, will be carried, will be uh, transported uh, to local politics. Mm -hmm. Not central politics, but local politics. Central politics, unfortunately, have been seized and captured uh, by right-wing populism in several places from the United States to India and Australia, in fact. I'm coming from one of the countries that experienced it in the most severe term. So um, I can tell you that it does not only damage and ruin the entire political sphere, but also it damages the basic morality of human being. Um, so, uh, but uh, after, you know, although all the central powers, you know, most, not all, but like, you know, many, uh, in many countries, central power is seized, um, thanks to Corona, in fact, we are now seeing that all these strong leaders, so-called strong leaders, are revealed to be totally inco incompetent. And we are also seeing that the local politics is taking over mm -hmm. when such political vacuum occur occurs. Um, in New York, in San Francisco, in London, in Istanbul, uh, the mayors or the governors, as in New York, are taking over and they are telling to people what they want to hear most. We are together with you. You're not alone. You're not on your own. So whoever makes people feel this, that they're not alone, takes over the politics, the political power. Not uh, the political, institutional political power, but um, he takes care and he takes um, he or she takes hold of the political energy. So I do think that 
the joy of dignity that is produced in the new progressive movements will be transformed uh, into new participation participation in local politics and that will change the coming decade and that will determine the coming decade also uh, this won't be pretty this won't be ha 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 so nice happy everybody's you know wanting the same thing there will i think the new dynamics will, will be created through the tension between central politics and local politics that is Mm, um, you know, taken over by new progressive movements. Um, yesterday, that, uh, not yesterday, uh, on Sunday, there, was elect there were general elections in Zagreb. Uh, and uh, on the same day, uh, my friends came to my apartment because I had a, you know, Sunday luncheon. So they all, you know, cast their votes and then they came. and. I think we had a discussion that happens all around the world on millions of tables, which is, you know the centrist party, you know the traditional social democrats, but the, you know, if you give your vote to the you know, new progressives, there's a, there might be a chance that your vote is wasted and so mm -hmm. on, in, co in quotations. Um, this uh, discussion is going on everywhere. Um, these concerns these hesitations are everywhere uh, because the traditional uh, representative system uh, could not match uh, the needs of our age. So it has to transform and it's going to transform. Uh, the thing is, hopefully it trans transforms very, very quickly or quick enough that we see it in our lifetime. Okay. Two questions for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, what happens with the joy of dignity of those who are on the right uh, wing and let's say not progressive? Are they getting the, the dignity from being part of these right wing movements, authoritarianism? Is that oh. where they are supported? Because we still have, uh, um, of course, not only in Croatia, but throughout the world, huge numbers of people who are definitely every day living this evil, mm -hmm. but are deciding to go uh, right wing. One what of happens the, there? Yeah, one of, uh, I think uh, the, the uh, most difficult job of new progressive political movements will be trying to explain people the difference between the word pride and dignity. Okay. Because right wing populism all around the world, without any exception, uh, use the same motto to rise to power. It was, your pride is broken and we're going to mend it. It wasn't dignity they're talking about, it was pride. These two words sound so similar to each other, uh, but actually they're completely different. Uh, pride is a violent word and uh, to mend a pride requires someone else, the other, kneeling in front of you and you are humiliating him in order to get your pride. Whereas dignity it always comes with oneness. Uh, if one's dignity is broken, all our dignity is broken. It doesn't uh, presuppose the other. There is no other in terms of dignity. But in terms of pride, yes, there is always another who breaks your pride and who is supposed to mend your pride. So pride is something that it's not about self-worth, uh, uh, if you talk about indi indi on individual level, it's not about self-worth, it's about how your worth is recognized, whereas dignity is about your self-worth. Mm -hmm. You don't need anyone to recognize it. Um, so the most important job of people like me, uh, or people who are acting and thinking about politics, progressive politics, will be this, to tell people who fell for this motto of pride that their dignity is broken and their pride, uh, even if they feel like they fix their pride, it won't be uh, in the, uh, for, for the benefit of humanity, one. Second, it's a fake thing. Mm -hmm. And they, they're going to have, we are all going to have a hard time to explain uh, that this, these right-wing populist leaders uh, who are promising people to mend their pride are actually the last 
mercenaries of capitalism. They are the last, you know, uh, food soldiers, in fact, uh, of a system that is trying to protect itself. So uh, they are the morbid symptoms, as Gramsci would say, uh, you know, that occur during the old is dying and the new is not born yet. So yeah, dignity, uh, it's not dignity they're talking about, it's pride, right. and pride is a very, very dangerous word, and it has been so since thousands of years, actually. Yeah. I mean, two thoughts are coming to my mind. On one hand, uh, pride somehow seems to be connected also to ego. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this uh, this problems that we have with egoistical leaders, which what we we, we recognize as charisma, yeah, is uh, something that, to me, seems that I have to go from education point of view. What can education do about it? I think there is a lot that we are not doing in education that we could in the terms of you know, what is solidarity, what is empathy, this idea that pride is to be a member of a nation, is there, you know, so all of these connections are something also that education has a lot to do with. Um, my other question is about feminism mm -hmm. and whether this um, uh, dignity can be somehow supported with feminist movements and how do we get people to understand feminism as it really is, rather than opposed to um, mm. Well, you know, S struggle for power. It's yeah. really struggle for cohesion and equality. I don't know how to. Yeah. I'm like, there are many, many books uh, about <laughs> this collective leadership and the feminist ideal of building a collective leadership and so on. And there's a lot of theoretical discussion. There has been since 1970s. Um, but then something reminds me now, your question reminds me now. Angela Davis. Angela Davis was the iconic figure of Black Panthers and American co communism in Amer in the United States in during the seventies, and she was incriminated. She was demonized. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then after Black Lives Matter movement started, uh, uh, following George Floyd's uh, killing, um, I have been thinking about her. It's as if I knew her personally. I was thinking, what would she feel? And so, probably a journalist like me uh, thought the same thing. So there was an interview with her and I watched it and she said, you know, after, you know, commenting on the moment, she said, um, feminism uh, is, you know, she talked about this collective leadership and feminism and how this woman should, not should, but like actually developing itself in those terms. Sometimes I do think that all that theoretical work that has been done since 70s, not only in terms of feminism, but also, you know, politi political thought and so on, socialism, uh, how can we really imagine socialism and so on, all those, all those uh, theoretical, all that theoretical work, and all the activism uh, that seemed until now inconsequential, were accumulating somewhere. And finally, when people had the energy and enough anger to go out to shout, they already had the words. So the, the words, uh, the slogans, the mottos were prepared for them through decades, thanks to all those people who sacrificed their lives for such movements. And now these people, you know, thousands and millions of people around the world are taught, you know, saying that capitalism and racism are intertwined. Mm -hmm. We have to reorganize like women do and so on. So um, feminism, and the you know women's studies would be leading the way we are still living in a man's world our cameraman is a man so sorry <laughs> no offense um, and men's world does not mean that there is only you know male domination it also means there is that there is no interest in female experience I'm a writer, and let me tell you how the industry of publishing goes. Mm -hmm. If you're a woman writer, you write work for women, period. Mm -hmm. It's not because women only read it, because um, we kind of surrendered 
to the fact that men are not curious about how women experience this world, how women experience this life. It's like when you write, when you write about women or women experience, it's like oh, out of question for men, uh, except, you know, except for very rare you know, examples, um, you write for women, that's for women. Women should read it and so on. Although we women have been reading about men for about 2,000 years now, more than 2,000 years. We are so curious about how men experience this world, yes. whereas they're not really giving two shits about <laughs> what we do. So, yeah, um, I think the way to change this is not only thinking about collective leadership and so on, but we have to make men be interested in that experience. And then they have to be interested as well. And it's happening. I'm like, I, I see it happening. Uh, so I, I do think that the future will have female aspects in, in that sense, or what we consider as female aspect, like, you know, collective leadership, the oneness uh, and mm -hmm. compassion and solidarity and so on. Empathy and so on. Empathy, I have thoughts about okay. that. Okay. <laughs> because whenever empathy comes, I, I think, do we really need it? I'm like, it feels a little bit primitive to me. Do I really have to put uh, myself in someone else's shoes to understand? No, uh, I don't have to do that. Uh, there is something beyond empathy to understand that we are not really different, we are actually one, we are part of one, okay. which is a little bit theological thought or actually a female perspective as well. But empathy is, some, there's something forced in it, there's something not really working. And also hearing this word from business world, for instance, makes mm -hmm. me mm, think, if business world uses that word, there might be uh -huh. something that is, well, I think that's very interesting because empathy has been a very big topic about uh, know. you know socio-emotional learning at school and how important empathy is and a lot of programs have been done for children and, but, and teachers on empathy. So yes, yeah. I, I just want to tell the audience that soon we will open to your comments. So please feel free okay, to send is, them to the chat. But uh, this is the last thing. Yes, let's. <laughs> but then you know this is a little bit more philosophical uh -huh. maybe. But understanding is one type of relationship that we build with life and with other people we don't have to understand sometimes or we might not understand sometimes still the other even though we don't understand it has a right to exist and it is not a right actually it is already the other is part of me so even if I don't understand it so even even if I don't want to understand it mm. okay Okay, so we're opening for your comments and questions. Um, I uh, will be sending, or you please send uh, your comments and questions to, to, to the chat. Uh -huh, I keep looking in the wrong place, I'm sorry, not used to cameras. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, if you do have a question, a comment, uh, you would like to take the floor, please let us know. I'll be looking at this here and be able to, to give you the floor. Meanwhile, um, Nothing is coming very quickly. I know that people are uh, hiding behind no. there. And <laughs> no, everything <laughs> was so clear. Yes, they I had made it very clear. Yeah, very clear. <laughs> Everybody knows <laughs> uh, what you wanted to say, but I'm sure there would uh, there will be a thing or two to mention. One thing that uh, while we're waiting for questions, uh, this reimagining, reinventing, mm -hmm. uh, we keep saying about we need to reinvent education and whether school is a good place and what are the, the what is the, let's say, the goal of education and then it comes out to somehow competition and assessment, which is another mm -hmm. way where we teach kids from very early age that it's about being better than somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I think that also connects to, to then this idea of pride if I and you know you hear parents yeah. say I'm so proud of my children yeah I have a friend who always says uh, she's a psychologist who says it's not about me and it's not yeah it's not about pride yeah it's about uh, even as a parent it's about allowing your your children to supporting them into becoming humans I guess in the end 
with some well kids education that's something that is like immense and i don't have a kid so i can talk whatever i want <laughs> <laughs> and okay i have that. nephews uh, and even though you are perfect you perfectly know these concepts uh, when real thing hits you it's completely different i remember my brother who is a film award winning filmmaker he's ideologically super pure and everything but i remember him turning on baby tv uh, and saying fuck the ideology i cannot take this crying anymore <laughs> so <laughs> education yes. and kids is it's completely different <laughs> yes and good luck to you in that sense i'm like if you're talking about kids no but generally in education it's it's a, it's it's a big it's a big topic i think um what we need to do somehow is bring these new ideas and and the world as we know it and as we were taught has given us some concepts that believe are true as mm -hmm. if they were facts yeah although they were just constructs yeah then and, and like very new constructs actually yes, yes. And um, I think the school is just perpetuating this. Yeah, and my kid is a con you know ch ch childhood is a contract construction and very very young construction. Okay. Is anybody asking anything? No, they're commenting. They're saying that thank you very much for such interesting ideas and reflections. But we would like to hear from you. So if anybody would like to ask a question, please uh, or to comment. We're very very quick. I mean, we could go on talking, Edge and me. I mean, I'm sure we... <laughs> I don't know if you would find that so interesting. But, yeah. Uh, um, no, but I'm thinking, did I miss anything? No, yes. I didn't. The other thing that is interesting, of course, when you talked about Croatian elections, that I thought is also a sign how this democracy is not really working in the way we imagined, just when you look at the numbers of people who actually went to elections. So we have under 47% of people who actually took their right to vote. Um, so well, maybe you should consider a social media campaign with a with round, a but <laughs> that might be interesting. I, uh, um, no, democracy is not a very exciting word anymore. Nobody, no. yeah, nobody believes in it. There is this uh, really distrust of. Uh, well, oh my God, there is a legitimate reason for that. Uh, uh, you know, our democracies are on restrained by capitalism. So whenever some, uh, you know, any party promises uh, more democracy, more equality, more social justice. We all know that it's not happening. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. The promises have become. Aha! Uh -huh. Question. We have a question mm -hmm. uh, from Nedim. Uh, he asks, how can how to feminize the schools? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, they are very feminine in a way because I don't know, like across the world. I mean, eighty percent of teachers or something are women. Yeah, that doesn't seem to. Yeah, help. that's feminine. <laughs> enough, huh? um, actually, very good question. Um, I was a, I was a mentor in one of this how should I uh, social solidarity projects I okay. say for uh, for mm, for young uh, girls coming from rural areas and they were on scholarship and I was mentor to one of them and then I met several of them and so on and then I thought you know how to feminize uh, it might be a good answer to this you can teach a girl anything you can give all the scholarships and everything but then one thing that nobody teaches us as girls mm -hmm. is the self-esteem mm -hmm. So there, might, there. I don't know how you, uh, you know, teach self-esteem, but teaching the uh, the young women and the, uh, you know, girls, uh, self-esteem would feminize the entire world actually, not only education. And then those girls becoming teachers might change everything in schools. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. We've got a, now we're having many questions. Yeah. Um, somebody had to open as usual. Uh, so the next question is almost personal. So great to have you here, Edge. They say, do you consider to go back to Turkey? And what would be conditions for you to continue your political struggle here? I think they say or there for us at the moment. Um, I'm not considering to go back to Turkey uh, because I'm good here. <laughs> and. Um, you know, after um, after a certain amount of time passes under an oppressive regime, there is a moral 
damage to the country. And, and during that moral damage, the, the word itself loses its value, its weight. And I'm a writer, I, I, I work with words. If words are, not me are meaningless in an environment, it is equally meaningless for me to be in that uh, you know, environment. So that's why I am here actually for my words uh, to have a weight, uh, a value, so to speak. And political struggle, I don't see myself as giving, you know, having, a, you know, giving a political struggle because I'm, I'm only writing, basically. And this is what I do. Is it a political struggle, really? Mm, this, can, this is a good discussion that has been going on for, I don't know, decades. Um, but yeah, I will keep on writing because this is what I do and I don't know how to live otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask you something? Does it have to do with language? The sense of, um, it's like a sub-question. You said mm -hmm. you work with words and there uh, you cannot work with the word. Is it because here you're not surrounded by the same words? Because I would say that the conversation is probably the same here as in Turkey, but being a little bit distanced from... Yeah. Well, I am... I kind of, you know, live in, I of course live in a different language now, uh -huh. in English. Uh -huh. um, and my uh, homeland is the language Turkish. And in that sense, I am in between because I'm still writing in Turkish, also writing and talking in English. Um, but then, as long as there are words, I can explain, I can tell the story. That's. Okay. Not that important, okay. the other, you know, details. Okay, so again, uh, thank you. You reflected a very clear picture of politics. But I wonder what you think about education as a tool for dominant, of dominant ideology. How can we design education as a transformative way under these circumstances? Whenever I'm asked, you know, as you talk about education, I keep thinking about my, I, uh, 1980. 1980 was the year of military coup in Turkey, uh -huh. uh, and it was a, you know, one of the cruelest military coups in modern world history. And my mother is a teacher. My grandmother is a teacher. Um, I come from a family of teachers, which is not a very comfortable thing. Um, but then on the year of 1980, I remember my uh, elementary school teacher changing and. The new teacher was um, uh, very content with the military regime and with the oppression. And I remember how painful it was. So I think it's, education is not a um, separate thing uh, from the other sections of society. If you transform the society, it, education transforms itself as well. Uh, mm. But then I think one thing uh, you know, one crucial thing is to be on the side of the, or anyway, I'm like, this is what I tell, because I am not really an expert on education, so I have to stop there. No, that's okay. I mean, I think what we always say in education is, you know, a lot of progressive movements, whatever it is, yeah. always say, or anything that is happening, whether it's STEM, IT, I don't know, uh, new movements, new political thought, all of this should be incorporated in education. Uh, but yeah. education always reflects the society. So, yes, I mean, education can be no different than the society we're living in. So but then, you know, it's, uh, it's too much expectation that education will change the society, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Although it, is, it has transformative mean? power in the sense of giving knowledge and, and other things. So it's not unimportant, but on its own. <laughs> well, I'm like, what I wanted to say actually with this 1980 thing is to keep the memory alive is part of a very good education, I think, because the dominant ideology, the dominant system always uses education as a you know, tool for oppression, obviously. Mm -hmm. But then uh, there should be people courageous enough and determined enough to say that, no, it didn't happen like that. Mm. And it is not like that. So there should be people, there should be not the kids, not the one who's educated, but the people surrounding them mm -hmm. uh, should be telling the teachers of the dominant ideology, no, 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 it wasn't like that. 
Okay, so we have a, a long question. You have mentioned about the importance of local politics instead of central politics. I would ask, shall enjoying local politics diminish the realm of central politics? Would not limiting politi political sphere to locality mean a kind of surrender to evil of banality? Mm. It goes on. By denying central politics and enjoying our self-dignity in local politics, keeping ourselves free of the dirt of central politics. Don't we leave central politics uh, su generis to he hegemony? Dirim asks this. Thank yes. you for this question which gives me uh, a chance to expand on my predictions. Um, like uh, this week I'm thinking about this so I am I have you know fresh uh, sort of uh, maybe two fresh ideas uh, about the topic. We might have to imagine a world without a center. Um, this new political material that we are dealing with does not act according to Newtonian physics but rather it is quite quantum. So we might have to imagine the entire uh, understanding of center and periphery. Maybe there won't be any center anymore. Mm -hmm. Connects a little bit to the growth discussion yeah. yesterday and about the importance of this uh, community yeah. and living in the local community. He has one more question. Is politics for preserving our dignity? Is politics for preserving our dignity or to change the system? What is the use of politics? Both. Okay, same from Thierry. Both. Um, but then I think the politicization will come uh, the motivation to politicize will come through the word dignity. That's why I talk, keep talking about dignity. It won't come through the word democracy or participation. Okay. That's why um, you know, I keep on talking about this mm -hmm. world. You cannot mobilize anyone on this world unless they are from an NGO through the word democracy or participation. That doesn't mean anything. It, you know, that it doesn't touch you as a person mm -hmm. and so on. Whereas dignity, we all know what dignity is and we all know the pain when it's hurt. So, and we are living in a system where every one of us is indignified. We don't have to be underprivileged to have a broken dignity. Even the most privileged of the system has a broken dignity because they also have to watch and feel nothing uh, when t uh, the TV is showing the you know starving kids that is indignified and even though they think they believe that they they are not in pain the most privileged they are in pain they are reduced as human beings so if we can tell this enough times everybody will understand that there might be a new life with fulfilled dignity okay okay so it's not only about the oppressed, it's also no, about the no. oppressor. Okay, another question. Any ideas how to promote the concept of human dignity so it becomes part of our social contract? Uh, like the pride, particular national pride, is already so much embedded in our societies. How do we change that from Vishnu? Interesting. Uh, dignity is already in our social contract. In almost every constitution there is the word dignity and mm. that the dignity is inviolable it is inalienable you know you cannot take dignity from a person whatever yeah. uh, and if you take the dignity of the peoples they are allowed to uprise this is in our social contract this is in human rights declaration this is everywhere it's just uh, i think it was um, it became muted for several decades, especially after the 1970s. We forget about it, maybe. Maybe we should go back to that, you know, mm -hmm. concept that dignity is 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 it cannot be seized away. Since you said go back, so that I'm thinking history. Uh, yeah. Was there a time that there was dignity? Well, there was, there were uh, invigorated, there were, you know, heated political movements towards dignity, especially in 1960s and beginning mm -hmm. of 1970s, but they were oppressed, mm -hmm. you know, very, very violently. 
So still on the horizon, but not it is <laughs> on the horizon. <laughs> on the horizon. Okay, another question. Thank you very much. A very interesting conversation and reflection. In my country, Belarus, Belarus, education is used as a tool for the promotion of dominant ideology. I would say almost in, in all countries, often based on fear and compliance. What could be the way to break free from the oppressive silo and use the education to change the status quo and the politics? Teachers, with some exceptions, are often reluctant to that when government policy is not favorable. From Hannah. Okay, maybe we need something to learn from 1960s Latin America, Latin American uh, political movements. Also, um, you know, might be surprising to some people, but from Muslim Brotherhood as well. Mm -hmm. How they came to power, of course, there was a lot of, you know, financial support, which is like, <laughs> changes everything. But still, they came to power, or they became powerful through health and education. Okay. And they started this grassroots movement from 19, end of 1960s, and that's why in 2000s you, they are so dominant in Egypt and in several other places. So if we talk about an alternative education, uh, you know, counter education against the oppressor, then we might or start organize the education ourselves, like we do in local politics. We might want to occupy that uh, institution as well. But then it's not only words. This takes time, energy, mm -hmm. dedication, commitment, and sacrifice on several levels. Actually, Belarus is a good thing because it's in a way homeschooling some sort of community or homeschooling. Uh, Belarus actually has a good example now in the pandemic. It was probably one of the only countries in the world that didn't close schools. Mm -hmm. um, oh. uh, but they had in their law, I guess, luckily, that you could home, because in Croatia it's not allowed, homeschooling mm -hmm. is not allowed. There is a lot of discussion about why homeschool can be also bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, it can go either way. <laughs> <laughs> and you can really go. Yeah, of course. Yes, and we know and from the States, examples of homeschooling sometimes really turns out into, into uh, uh, a big evil. But yes, uh, what parents did in Belarusia then, since kids were forced to go to school, uh, they used this idea that they can homeschool. Yeah. Keep them out of the school in the in the time of pandemic. So it's amazing. Yes, lovely. So, yeah. So people, yeah, there are there are obviously this this local and community things. Exactly. That that uh, that can be done. Okay, more questions. Uh, looking back to previous experiences of cruel oppressions, are you optimistic about local politics? Will they have a chance when they get more power to transform the central politics? What can be the advantage of Zeitgeist? Esgi. Mm. You know, what is he? Uh, that's a Turkish name. I Hello, is he? Um, <laughs> I think that we have quite a few Turkish uh, audience. This understanding of contamination is, is the problem. I mean, like, especially the young generation thinks politics is something corrupt, uh, you know, from the very beginning. Um, so, there is a problem there. Politics is not a corrupt concept. The current state of it is corrupt. So, mm, the, you know, the, there is a perception behind this question. Is you know, as far as I sense, and we have to we have to erase that uh, assumption that politics is something corrupt. Um, so contamination. You know, this the idea is constantly there, you know, for those people who join the protests, um, you know, going uh, towards representative democracy, going towards the representative democratic institutions is a way to contaminate yourself. It's not like that. Um, I'm thinking this new political material that we are talking about as a fluid material. And we always think that the fluid is submissive to container, it takes the shape of the container. Whereas, it act, fluid is not a submissive matter. It depends on the pr amount of the pressure and the nature of the fluid. Enough amount of water can, you know, explode the metal. Uh, the acid can leak into cement and so on. 
So we shouldn't always think that the contaminated institution, the corrupt institution, will contaminate the new political material that is coming, you know, inside it. But then it, the opposite can happen as well. Uh, the new political material, the new progressive movements can also reshape the container. So this is, that's why I say maybe the new politics will not follow the Newtonian physics, but it will be more quantum because maybe this time the fluid will shape the container. Mm -hmm. And the uh, airplane rack will become the riff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it takes, uh, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. Maybe not that long though. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not that long. So yeah, as he confirms that she is from Turkey. Yeah. Or, or, or he, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, she. She, okay. Um, I think this is uh, it from your questions. We have a couple more minutes. So if um, last minute... Uh -huh, there is mm -hmm. one more. Um, I suppose it is we Turks more eager to ask about central versus local politics due to our failed attempts to knock down evil of banality in 2013. Ah, he means Gezi uprising. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about such protests like Tahrir uh, in Egypt, El Caspa in Tun Tunisia, or Podemos in Spain, or in, in Greece, especially uh, Gezi as well, we tend to either roman romanticize it mm -hmm. or we tend to be cynical about it. Oh, it wasn't that big, it, nothing came out of it anyway, yeah. and so on. No, it was very big full stop and it was very important full stop and it's still there full stop these things you know these movements these political reactions do not all of a sudden appear and then disappear it is just a continuous yet intermittent walk of dignity as i would call it mm -hmm. <coughs> And if we pay attention and if we have the historical perspective, we can see that each of these protests, big, massive protests, evolved. And it was, uh, they also, these masses, each time they showed up in different places on the world, they learned something new. Mm -hmm. And they are still evolving. That's why we see Black Lives Matter now being so strong to, you know, to have an impact on the rest of the world. And then the next one will be different and more um, developed, more sophisticated mm -hmm. and more ready to face the challenges and so on. Uh, so Gezi is still there in that sense. It is now in the local politics of Istanbul, Ankara and Izmir. Mm -hmm. All that political energy, where did it come from? Of course it came from Gezi. There was nothing else before and nothing else after. Well, a little bit, you know, there were things after, but before that nothing else. So. Gezi created the zeitgeist, the new jargon of politics, the new perspective of politics, new ideals for politics, for especially for the new generation. So, and the joy, the joy of it was uh, incredible. So that joy uh, transformed itself to a victory in local politics, despite immense oppression from the central politics. I think this gives also quite a lot of optimism to all of us who who who, who try to do things. No, and I'm not an optimist. I am like <laughs> to me, I am. <laughs> no, I am an optimist, and I I, I I find this duality not really helpful, like okay. pessimism, optimism. Okay. And by the way, mostly I'm considered to be the Cassandra of uh, politics, but now I'm <laughs> a little bit Mary Poppins. But so. But then this is reality, this is how you read history, this is how I read history or time in our, uh, our times and so on. Also, I have to add, yes, I am on the side of the resistance, obviously, so my words are to support them. I, wouldn't, I cannot be cynical or fatalistic about them, so I have to support them with my words. So there's a little bit of uh, exaggeration maybe, but I don't think it is completely out of place. <laughs> okay, we have one more question and then we'll close so that we try to keep to our timing, although of course this conversation could go on for a long, long time. Can we learn from old human societies like Maori people in New Zealand or Aborigines in Australia from Sanya? Yes, I've been reading about this. Uh, there's an amazing book called, called, book called Communitas 
it's a women's studies book. Um, I'm, I, I'm so sorry, I forgot the name of the writer, but the name of the book is Comunitas. It's an academic paper, ac academic book. So I would really suggest that book. Uh, yes, we can, and people do uh, try that at this point. Uh, but then it won't be old, it will be renewed old and so on. Uh, but yes, that is a good example to look at. But then it is not, you know, can we go back to old things? There is no going back in history, unfortunately. I'm, I, <laughs> I come from di dialectic materialism, so I cannot say that we can go old, but then we can go forward and maybe the horizon is, has similar things with the old. Well, thank you very much, Ajit. This was really thank enjoyable. We, I'm sure the audience and all the comments were very positive. We don't see you, but we will wave to you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. We'll have a short break now, about 15 minutes. We'll come back uh, with a presentation on democratization of public services. Thank you for I watching. Think, oh, yes, <laughs> yes. So thank you again. Um, thank you for Thank you, Lana. It was thank great. You. It was thank great you. having you. Bye. See you in 15 minutes.